All right, Joe, so I love to give options. So I got a question. Punch from Francis Ngannou or a road trip with George Masvidal? Wow, I'm probably going to have to take the punch with Francis, right? It's like that old rip the Band-Aid off, but we got to get this over with right now. He's the good guy, I'm the bad guy, and you all are very wise for tuning in because we're going to talk all things UFC. Chill. What's up, my guy? How you doing today, dog? Never better. I appreciate it. What's happening with you, dog? You know what? What's happening with me is I'm up early. In the morning. Hey, you like when I get hip, Chael? You like when I get hip? You know, I'm 45 years old. I like that. That doesn't mean I have to let go of me being like the hip guy because I'm still the good guy, but I'm still pretty hip. You know, that's like the kid. That's what the kids all say. You know, <laughs> he gets lit. In the Cormier household. Chael, last week, we were talking about all these great fights that we have coming up. But Dana White announced what's coming from Saudi Arabia. And you know, we go to the Middle East, the cards are big. And this is what he had to say. What's up, guys? Here with another announcement. On Saturday, June 22nd, we'll be going to Saudi Arabia. Our first fight in the kingdom will be a fight night that will air live and free on ABC. And the main event will be former middleweight champion Robert Whitaker versus 13-0 undefeated Hamza Chemaev to see who will be the number one contender for the UFC middleweight championship. Jail, now I ask you this question. First off, anytime the UFC does an ABC card, it's massive. And one time, bro, they gave us the yellow jackets from the wild world of sports. We never looked better standing next to the octagon. And you knew that this one would be huge. But Hamza Chemaev fights Robert Whitaker in the main event. I know we're going to talk a ton about Chemaev and what it means to those guys as it goes forward. But my first question to you is, how tough is Robert Whitaker, bro? He fights everybody. Hey, I am... Daniel, I am so impressed. I mean, historically speaking, it's kind of hard to get uh, Whitaker to agree to fights. He just does big fights. He's used to main events. He's worse, uh, used to world title fights. Everything's almost a downgrade. He's a hard guy to book. He just got out of a war with Paulo Costa. I thought that was enough to be number one contender. I could say the same compliments about Shemaev. He just got out of a war with Kamar Usman. I thought that was enough to be number one contender. Now, I'm not arguing that. I'm speaking to how tough this division and how deep it is, and the guys and the participants are aware of that. So you got two guys with great arguments to number one contenders, but nothing else to do. They come and find each other. They're doing it on ABC. Come on. This is as big as it gets. This is the announcement, and frankly, I knew this is where the UFC and Dana was trying to get. I wasn't overly confident they could get there. This is a very hard booking, and it's a fairly quick turnaround by Whitaker standards. You know, when I heard the fight card, I thought, oh, my goodness. But then I kind of had to step back and go, well, it's kind of been Robert Whitaker's M.O., right? Because when he lost to Israel at Asanya the first time, he fought everybody else, right? He went and fought uh, Jared Cannonier. Well, nobody would fight Jared Cannonier. He fought Kelvin Gaslam. He fought Paulo Costa. Now, every time he finds his way to a championship opportunity, he loses or if he loses he goes and takes the toughest route to get back you got to remember just a couple fights ago he fought drake and duplessis with a chance to be the number one contender again so he's never like he never tries to choose the opponent but the hamza chamaya fight to me it's massive in two regards because it finally feels like chamayev is knocking on the doorstep of or standing on the doorstep of a championship opportunity. For a long time, we thought that Hamza Chemaev would become a guy that would fight for the UFC championship. He just seemed destined for it. Then he beats Kamaru Usman. Granted, Kamaru's up. It's on short notice. It's very competitive. He wasn't as dominant as you thought, but you knew he wouldn't be because Kamaru's that good. And now he gets Robert Whitaker back-to-back. -back. There could be no denying that he should fight for the championship next. But this fight tells me two things. It tells me one. These two are going to fight in Saudi Arabia to decide who gets the championship opportunity. It tells me, too, that the next fight 
for the middleweight champion, Drake is Duplessis, is already done. They know it's Israel Adesanya. Because if you didn't know it was Israel Adesanya, you would keep one of these two guys open to have the opportunity to give a guy an, a chance. I, I don't know what that means for Sean Strickland, but I really do feel like he might get pushed to the back now that they just booked that fight between those two. All right, now, they call you the good guy, but you were not the easily impressed guy. So that was very high praise that you just gave to this fight partner. I fully agree with you, but if we're going to play Let's Look at the Division, let me throw myself in here. I like the idea and the concept that whoever wins between Chemayev and Whitaker gets that due and gets their respect. It'd be a hard thing for me to imagine that you could motivate them for anything less than at least acknowledging that they're a number one contender. But, partner, please hear this. I don't personally think there's a scenario where Whitaker versus Izzy for the belt happens again to remind you if it was to happen again oh. you would have two guys a little bit later in their careers oh by the way they're going to go do something for the third time that was not ultra competitive the first two now when you do look at Duplessis Duplessis surprise, surprises all when he beat Whitaker I mean that was a three to one spread favoring Whitaker it was not supposed to happen yep. it was dominant by Duplessis and there's always a way to do a rematch however things would be a little bit easier if Chemayev was to get that nod we're hearing rumors of travel restrictions for Chemayev my, nobody's confirmed that, at least not that my ears have heard. <laughs> yeah. I'm only suggesting for you, yes, this should be a number one contendership, but it does look as though uh, the victor versus... Right, we're going to have to play these matches out is what I'm saying. Who comes out of Duplessis and Izzy is going to matter. Who comes out of Whitaker uh, versus Chemayev is going to matter. You know, but we talked, like, everybody's heard those those issues, the the, the rumor of the travel issues. But even if he can't, right? Now that there's a Saudi Arabia card, there's a fight there. There's fight cards in, in England now multiple times. There's fight cards in Abu Dhabi that obviously could go. So, and most champions don't fight that often, Chael. So, like, that would be opportunities. But you're right. Not many people would be clamoring to watch Izzy versus Whitaker for a third time. But so much has to happen in order for us to get there, right? Whitaker has to go and beat Chemayev, who everybody believes, or so many yep. believe, is so high level, will be a tough match for him. Izzy has to beat Drake is due plus C. But for me, what about Sean Strickland, Jill? What about Sean Strickland, a guy that was the champion a fight ago and seemed to be building momentum into being a guy that people really were tapped into? They liked Sean Strickland as champion. So what does it mean for him now when you see all these, that well, that matchup done and the rumors of the Izzy versus Duplessis, because guess what, Chill? Sean Strickland only said that he would, he pretty much threw a fit saying he was ready to leave because of the rankings and because of the title shot opportunity rematch. The only reason you come out publicly and say that is you're not hearing what you want to hear, what you want to hear internally that tells you you'll be getting the fight that you want. Yeah, hey, listen, the mandate of the masses is the most important thing you can have. And yes, it does appear that Strickland versus Duplessis was the really big fight. Now, Dana himself, before he even made Duplessis versus Izzy, tried to make Strickland versus Izzy. My only point being, and we all heard the rumors and the attempts that were made by the UFC to bring Duplessis and Izzy together for UFC 300. I share that because generally when somebody holds out, somebody new does get an opportunity. That would be Strickland. And I think that was his biggest argument. He's sitting around saying, hey, listen, I beat one of these guys in Izzy, one of the judges, it was fairly controversial, thought he had beaten Duplessis. Yeah. I don't mind the argument, but when you ask what's next for Sean Strickland, I couldn't really tell if you were asking that rhetorically speaking and wanted to rebuke, but let me give you one because I have two guesses and they're very different. One is that Sean Strickland is used as a backup fighter for either of these two uh, major matches that we're speaking about. And the no second, Daniel, that. there is a reason no Bo chance. Nickel is getting the push. There is a reason that Bo Nickel is getting the shine at UFC 300. I don't know what it is, but my guess is at some point, he's going to have to play with one of the big names. That big name that's sitting available, it's going to be Sean Strickland. Chill. That, chill. That's very, look, that's interesting because, look, most times when you hear stuff, if it makes you sit up, if it makes you sit up, right? Because we don't, I don't sit up very often because you pretty much hear and see all of it. But hearing that, like, well, Bo Nickel gets through this guy. But, I mean, Bo Nickel is fighting the, 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 the kid from Colorado that is on a two-fight win streak. But 
the fight before his last win was a no. Uh, uh, Jacob Malkoon hit him on the ground, and he got a disqualification win when he was really losing. So he's it's a it would be a big jump for Bull Nickel. And honestly, I don't know if Sean Strickland. I, I don't know if me as Sean Strickland would say, okay, I'm gonna fight a guy in Bull Nickel who's never fought anyone ranked in the top 15, who's never really fought anyone at that level, and a guy that I know could potentially be a nightmare matchup for me to give him an opportunity. So while I love it, Chill, I can't see that as likely, bro. Come on, you think Sean Strickland would fight Bo Nickel? First off, yes, I do think that Sean would take the fight. Now, I understand that it's a stretch. I would just have to remind you uh, of two stories. First off would be, uh, it, well, Charles Oliveira, quite frankly. We, the Charles Oliveira store, the run, the championship, the main event guy, that story never happens. Had Tony Ferguson, who was up in the loft with a big name, had him drop the ladder yeah. down so that Oliveira could climb up. There's a bunch of good fighters, but there was five stars, and we were keeping them away from each other. Now, it's very interesting that you tell me that a guy that's got a big name and all and all this run and all this stroke might fight an unknown because the fight before your title fight is what's known as your number one contenders fight and for you it was against a barista who was tough as an old leather boot but he'd never even been in the UFC <laughs> nobody knew who he was Pat Cummings come in mm -hmm. Daniel Cormier's got a lot of pressure Daniel Cormier got to do one thing which is look good he stops Pat Cummings and goes on to fight for his first championship I'll just share for you a lot of times this is how things are done oh you're right, Chill. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, I don't know how you could possibly use my situation on me, but, I mean, that's why you're here. You're here to put me in my place at times as the bad guy. Chill, I'm moving forward, right? I'm done with the conversation because I hate whenever you get the best of me. So I'm done with the conversation. I'm going back to Atlantic City. I'm going back to a place where... You, as a American, would think, man, I'm going to make some money. I'm going to experience a great time. But you don't always experience a great time in, in, in Atlantic City. Now, we thought, and I got to be honest with you, last year, last week we had the coronation. We had the coronation of Erin Blanchfield. We spoke of her greatness. We spoke of how good she is. We spoke of how... She is so skilled and well-rounded, and Manon Fior said, to heck with all of that. I'm bringing my whipping stick, and I'm going to put it on this young lady. And that's exactly what she did. Bro, how impressed were you by Manon Fior last weekend as she shut out Aaron Blanchfield over 25 minutes? Blanchfield was not quite a two-to-one favorite, but she was close enough for these terms. She lost every single round, according to the judges. I mean, what, what, what Fjord went out there and did was so impressive, not to mention in a main event. If you're main event in anything, there's a level of ice that's got to be go going through your veins. There's not very many experiences that you're going to get that are going to take you further and be with you uh, more than just walking out in that spot, not to mention over former world champions. And I, I only say that because Chris Weidman has won the card. She was chosen to go above the All-American. It does matter. Now, what do you do with her? Look, I think when the rankings come out, we're still one day early on that, but I would predict she's going to move uh, to number two. So there was a suggestion made. I'm, I'm going to steal it from bloodyelbow.com, but the suggestion was that Fjord go against Macy Barber. Another suggestion is that she just wait for Grosso and Shevchenko. Yes. I personally think Grosso and Shevchenko has a couple of issues. I think having a backup fighter there is very important. Uh, I mean, Shevchenko herself is doing interviews. I got to take her at her word. She says she's not going to do the fight unless it's in what she deems to be neutral territory. I do think that fight goes off. I'm just sharing for you to have somebody in a backup position. Is it the worst idea I've heard all day? That's the one I'm, I'm that's what I'm doing too. If I'm an off you, I'm not fighting. There's no reason to go from the, the fights that she has had and take another one when she's undefeated in the UFC. She's looked increasingly better and she's just standing on the verge of her championship opportunity. I get it. I would like to see her fight Macy Barber, but the way she looked last weekend, she looks like she's ready now to fight for the belt. So if I'm her, it's more likely, in my opinion, that she weighs in as a backup fighter. She trains alongside that championship fight and waits to have her opportunity. But her takedown defense, 
looked really good. Her striking, as we know she is known for, looked amazing. She just seemed to be a step ahead of Erin Blanchfield. Granted, Blanchfield continued to try. She continued to try to get her hand raised. She continued to fight hard. But you could see very early in that fight that she really had no answers for what Manon Fior brought to Atlantic City. And it was very impressive. I, I got to say, I didn't expect that. Even though, like, I, I don't pick fights, which I'm lucky to not have to do anymore because of the commentary. But if I had to pick that one, I was definitely going to say Blanchfield. And it's going to be 50-45 uh, the other way. But Manon Fior showed that's why you fight the fight. And she did a fantastic job. Yeah, I fully agree. Whatever comes next for her is going to be uh, very meaningful, but how she plays this situation is going to be meaningful as well, right? It's always okay to read what they write about you, but if you start to believe it, it can be a problem, and that goes both ways, where somebody thinks they become so great and they take their eye off the ball a little bit, or they get a little bit down on the dubs because uh, a lot of times the people that are speaking about them aren't so nice. It's okay to see it, but make sure that you can ignore it in a healthy manner, and I got to tell you about Blanchfield. You and I did praise her for her skills, but she did show something very positive even in this defeat which is her grit and her toughness she stayed in there she just yep. wasn't as good of a fighter she was just a step slow these fights ultimately are a dance in that only one person can lead at a time and if your partner comes out and takes charge the whole time you're waiting you're waiting for them to relinquish as they've got to get a couple of breaths and feel their gas tank back up Fior just simply didn't do it she took charge at the beginning right if this was a race she got out front and she stayed there yes yeah, she stayed there the whole time chill and Grit determination is something that will allow for Aaron Blanchfield to work her way back into the title picture. But Saturday night belonged to Manon Fior. And, the you know, when you think about her past, right, she's, seven, she's won seven fights in a row. She's undefeated in the UFC. And you get opportunity first, right? Hamza Chimaev is on the verge of it. Right now, he beat Kamaru Usman. Now he's putting... Robert Whitaker behind that to build a resume that says, I deserve a chance to fight for that championship belt. Manon Fior, same type of thing. She beats Rose Namajunas, a former champion. So when she got the big opportunity to show that she belonged on that level, she got the job done. They said, okay, Manon, now you have to fight the dangerous contender, the young, hungry person who we see or most see as the rising shooting star. If you get through that, now you're on a really, really uh, short list of people that have potential to be a champion. I got to be honest with you. Macy Barber has looked amazing. But to make Manofior fight Macy Barber after fighting Rose Namajunas and then Aaron Blanchfield would seem as though it's just a bit of a time filler, right? Because those two are higher ranked. Those two are more accomplished. Those two seem to be the ones that everybody had tabbed as, obviously, Rose, a former champion. Uh, Aaron Blanchville, a potential champion. Macy Barber, I wouldn't I wouldn't make her fight her. I think it would just be like, fight her if you just want to fight Manon Fior and stay active. But you've already done enough to earn a chance to fight for the championship. That's fair. That, that's fair. I, and, and generally, it's not that situation. Generally, you don't ever want to wait. Max Holloway just waited on this uh, a week ago, uh, thinking that, you know, if he beats Gaethje, he would be ready to go in either division. He could go up to 55. Uh, he could go back down to 45. He said, but I'm never going to wait. They argued and said, well, why wouldn't you? It would sure look like you're in a top position. He simply said, tell me a time that that's ever worked out for somebody. But I do understand your point here, because the circumstances are slightly different in that we don't have a date yet for Grasso and Shevchenko. We've got some rumors, but they're doing the ultimate fighter right now. Then that's going to air. You've always got the injuries, the things you've got to work out. Even the official bout agreement okay. that according to Shevchenko, just on location alone, hasn't worked out yet. I'm only sharing that you make a good point. That division is in a unique time and having a number one contender that appears we've clearly identified and having them wait and prepare alongside the champion and, and the current signed opponent it makes sense. It seems like the ultimate fighter used to mean you had to fight the person you coached again, but that's not necessarily true. You remember Connor like coached with Uriah Faber, and then he coached with Michael Chandler, and he still hasn't fought him. So it's no guarantee that you get the fight with the person you spent six weeks hating inside the ultimate fighter house. You just got to do the show. But, Chael, last week, Joaquin Buckley had the biggest win of his career. Now. 
when we have watched Joaquin Buckley, you have seen a guy that always seemed to exude potential. He looked like he could be very dangerous. He looked like he could be a, a problem in whatever division he was fighting in. Well, he's down at 170 now. He's more lean. He's more committed to himself getting ready to fight. And he gets an opportunity to fight 11 ranked Vicente Luque. He finishes him, Chael. He finishes Vicente Luque, who we have seen fight everybody in the division and fight everybody competitive. How impressed were you by this dude? Like, is this the Joaquin Buckley that we all expected so long ago? I was blown away. Uh, for multiple reasons. I mean, the whole thing that we're trying to do out there, partner, is to take the other guy's will. We, we, we want to what we call break him, which just is at some point in the fight, whether you can do that physically or mentally or most likely a combination of the two, make him realize this guy wants this more than I do. I thought I wanted it more, but he's proven his point to me. And if we could just get our opponent to think that for one second, one second will change that night. And I only bring that to you because I've never seen Luke check out before. Luke is as tough as they get. He's in the five-round club. He's fought the yep. top guys. Not to mention, mm -hmm. he's got more submissions. It might really surprise you. If you come and look at his record, you'll be blown away with how well he does on the ground. That's where he wanted this fight. Hey, that was step number one in the mm -hmm. wrong direction as he was conceding position. I talked to Dan Gable one time in my entire life. It was a podcast interview. <laughs> Dan Gable that was known for pressure, for coming out, for doing things that other guys couldn't, things that were revered. But he shared something with me that I didn't know and he told me at a point in his life he was the hardest worker he did want it he was the most determined but he didn't know how to win a wrestling match and what he was talking about is using that energy over the course of a match making sure that I don't just outwork my opponent but I do it in three minutes and then I'm out there struggling uh, for the next two rounds this was coach Gable as an athlete about 68 69 by 72 he wins the Olympic Games he learned how to finish a match and that's what I saw within Buckley I saw the same athletic in this contest as I've seen in ones that he's lost. Ones where he's come out and looked good, but he handed it back. He blinked a little bit, if you will. This one, eyes wide open. Used the energy. Outworked his opponent. Understood there's still a ref. There's still a clock. There's still a round system. Operating within all of that, this was the perfect performance this far in Buckley's career. Chael, you said it. Did you see it? Did Vicente Luque pack his bags? Did he pack his bags in there? Did you yes. see it? When he felt the power on the ground, did you see him kind of check out a little bit? Yes. Yes, it, it was very visible. And, and, you know, as fighters, that's the last thing we want to happen. We always want to stay engaged. Luke has done that no. his whole career. I do not tough, uh, question his tough uh, toughness or his grit, but every now and then, you'll feel something that we, the audience, can't see. Sometimes you'll take it with you all the way through your career and to your grave, but you feel something. A fight turned out to be harder than you were expecting it to be, or a shot to the abdomen that a lot of the crowd didn't see and the announcers missed. Just for example, something appeared to happen within the fight that did frustrate Luke and made him think, you know what? I got to get to the back. I've been in that spot. It's a tough one to be in, yeah. but yes, yeah. I, I did feel that, that Luke, who is as mentally tough as they come, checked out about six minutes in. I can't believe it. I really saw it, and I could not believe it, but I think it speaks to Joaquin Buckley because he's pulled guard before. He's pulled guys on top of him. He's found his way out of those positions. He has managed the damage he takes whenever the guy's on top of him landing ground and pound, but it wasn't the same this weekend. Joaquin Buckley hit him, and he hit him so hard that you could see him kind of fold. And I was like, wow, Buckley seems to be finding his groove, right? Or he's going to empty the tank here. He's going to empty the tank knowing that this is his opportunity to get Vicente Luque out of here. That's a dangerous proposition considering we have seen Luque get through this on so many different occasions. But it became very clear that we were watching something different because when he never shrimped, when he never turned back to face Joaquin Buckley, when he didn't go grab an underhook, I said, oh, Buckley's hitting him much harder than we see, and it might be over. I mean, Buckley never had to secure him. Once he got to the ground chill, the whole time he stayed postured up. We as wrestlers know that you want to hit, hit, grab him so you don't lose him. Hit him, hit him, grab him so you don't lose him. Buckley never grabbed him again to secure him. He stayed over him, posture space, landing those big bombs because Vicente never did anything or could not do anything to make him try to change the position. 
It was very impressive. And I watched a video of Joaquin Buckley that morning or mid-afternoon of the fight in Atlantic City at the pool listening to Meek Mill, like just getting the entire crowd at the pool party going crazy. And I thought to myself, there's no way he is that comfortable on the cusp of engagement, on the, 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 at the doorstep, on the battlefield, getting ready to engage in war. He cannot be that comfortable. Joaquin Buckley was that comfortable. His mindset has now changed. He feels he's a champion. And chill, like you said, maybe he has now put that together when your athleticism meets your maturity and it allows for you to compete at the highest level. But then it leads to this, right? It's always this. It's a repeated record for us every time. Guy gets a big win. We start to wonder who's next. This guy will be ranked for the first time in his career starting this week. Who do you see Joaquin Buckley fighting the next time he gets in the octagon? Because he has to go up, right? Luke was 11. Yes, and this was a dominant stoppage win over number 11. I, I don't know that I would predict for you that he could get on the docket with Ian Gary, but I'm going to submit that name all the same just to really prove the point that he's going to be rewarded for this. There is going to be something very recognizable. He's not going to move off the main card. He's going to start moving up, and he's definitely going to move up in competition. And by the way, a name that I don't see there but I think is very possible, particularly uh, if Buckley went and got something started, went after him, is Michael Venom Page. Oh, yeah. You, you you like Michael Venom Page. You like hooking him up in fights. You like uh, matching up Venom Page. You impressed with him down in Miami. Chill. He also said he wants to fight in Missouri, but he said he wants to be the main event. Right now, we have Derek Lewis versus Nazi Mento. Nazi Mento as the main event. And honestly, you put Buckley in there with a big enough name in that place where he was born or raised or he was growing up in that area, I say let him do it. Give Buckley an opportunity to fight five rounds for uh, a chance at moving up the rankings and main eventing a card. I think it would be a great time, and I think it would be fun. Uh, I got, wide. Oh, wait, you got to let me respond to that. We have never had somebody try to steal a card placement. We've never had somebody try to steal a main event once it's announced. If he's got a good enough argument, he's breaking the top ten. Oh, by the way, you're telling me Missouri is his home territory? I'm with you, partner. I want to see him go for it. We'll back him up over here. And it's not like Derek Lewis and his dance partner wouldn't like to come down to three rounds. Buckley, you go out there. That's your hometown. That's your card. <laughs> go steal that spot. You like it, Jill? You like it? That's a bit of a bad guy move. That's a bad. I, I, Derek Lewis, you're out. I'm in. I'm taking the headliner spot. My hometown, my main card. I kind of like it. I love it. You know, you know, Chris Weidman, we were talking about this the other day. Former champion, had a bad run, right? He was not looking good. He spoke about how great he felt leading up to the fight. And I'll be honest with you, I don't think he ever, I don't think he's looked that good in a long time. He looked great last weekend. He was winning the fight, and it was very clear that he was winning the fight. But then the eye pokes. Confusion. Chris Weidman knocks Bruno Silva out. The Atlantic City crowd go crazy. He jumps over the octagon. They announce it as a TKO. Two minutes later, they say they scored the fight, and it was a unanimous decision for Chris Weidman. He pokes him in the eye. The overwhelming sentiment from the world is that Chris Weidman got away with one. What did you think watching that last weekend, watching Chris beat Bruno Silva? He won the fight. He was going to win the fight regardless. But, I mean, four or five eye pokes, uh, it was odd is all I can say. Well, and Daniel, a, a continuation of a lot of odd events that's happened to a guy. I mean, in all fairness, one of the uh, biggest upsets of all time, one of the biggest injuries of all time. I remember a uh, real controversy, and it was only eight days after the unified uh, rule was adopted and changed with the grounded opponent and what that meant. I'm talking about Chris Whiteman versus Gegard Mousousi. And not to mention, Gegard was such a massive name back then. It was such a beautiful uh, performance by Whiteman. Ends up going against him. I'm just bringing to you, Whiteman's had 
some strange things happen to him. As far as looking good, yes. The All-American, he's going to be called the unbreakable pretty soon here. I mean, he is just flat tough. You talk about being able to get up and push forward. It's the best performance I've seen him have out of the last six. I liked him in the last six, even the ones that went against him. I thought that he competed and performed very well. This was a surprisingly good Chris Weidman out there when you talk about the eye poke, though, specifically the finish based on what I saw. And I must tell you, we talk about the unified rules, and the unified rules are not necessarily the unified administrative rules. And the reason I point that out, I can tell you what they would have done in Nevada, and it's not what they did in New Jersey. I could tell you what they would do in Oregon. Right off the top of my head, I could even stat the statute for you. But that's not necessarily what they have to do in a different state like New Jersey. And I don't know the New Jersey rules. I will tell you, Nick Limbo, the head of that commission, is known. He's got a reputation that he will make sure the right adjudication happens, even if he have to go in the office, watch that tape, and refile it with his own commission. Most places, your opponent would have to appeal. Not always in New Jersey. That's one way to do it. But Nick Limbo will go back and look at it. I got a hold of Big John McCarthy this morning. Big John wrote me back and said, I will get you an answer, and I, j I just simply don't have it yet, partner, or we would have that. But I do believe on appeal, this is probably going to be overturned, at least in Nevada and Oregon, I believe that it would be. I That's don't actually know New Jersey. But Chael, come on. So, Chael, there's a rule in place that if you go past a certain point in the fight, it's it's scored. It's scored. Like, if there is an illegal blow no or an accidental illegal blow, they score the fight. If you score that fight, Chris Weidman wins. So I think by them making it a decision, it saves the fight staying a win for Chris Weidman because he really did deserve to get a victory in that fight because he fought so well. He made one point that I think is very important, Chael. He said, I get it, but Bruno Silva has to understand you can't fall to the ground and turn away from the fight because me as the fighter, I am going to jump on you and finish the fight. Chris Weidman did what his instincts told him, and that was to go finish Bruno Silva when Bruno reacted in the way that he did from the eye poke. I, I, I'm only saying this, Chael, because to me, it, it felt like a soccer player. When they get fouled and they're rolling around on the ground when the guy barely touches them. Look, Bruno Silva got eye poked. But I think he understood where he was in the fight. He was getting beat. He was losing. He fell to the ground. He reacted the way he was reacting, hoping, wait, wait, stop, 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 poke in the eye, fight, no contest. Instead, Weidman went and finished it. That's my thought. Sure, sure. And, and and, Dan, and the only reason I'm staying on this is because Bruno and company have said that they're going to appeal it. And the reason I think it's important that maybe we do uh, get this properly adjudicated, I think there's a rematch. I mean, I, I think that you have to go to a rematch if they overturn this decision. Chris Weidman, disappointingly in all fairness, uh, but also surprisingly, said he's not going to retire. Said, I actually went out there and I felt really good. I believe him. I thought he looked uh, really good. I just also thought with all the memories and maybe, you know, you try to go out on top, not very yeah. many guys uh, get to do that. So if this does get pushed back on, you're going to have a rematch. And look, it does come down to a lot of technicalities, but I want to tell you one of them, which is if we're going to go to the cards in New Jersey, that has to be a decision that the doctor and the referee come to, and the referee has to signal for that. He has to signal we are done here. Where are we at? Okay, we're over 75%. The turn to the cards. He did not do that, at least not that I saw. I'm judging his body language. Perhaps he walked over to the head table and he said those words, but if he did not put that, uh, that in place, he does not have the authority within the mechanism to turn to the cards, which is something I found out they did three hours later when I read about it. I didn't even know that by watching the broadcast. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy, man. They had some real weird officiating last weekend. Uh, a couple bad stoppages, referees getting involved, but hey, it's Atlantic City, so what more do you expect but bad? <laughs> okay. Is there okay. something with Atlantic Listen. City? Did you have an experience <laughs> in Atlantic City? Okay, did, did she do something to you at one point? Are you <laughs> sitting on something? What happened with you in Atlantic City? Maybe, <laughs> maybe one day I'll tell you. Maybe the next time we go back to, to Atlantic City, they make me go as a punishment, and I will then tell you why I like to do what I do. <laughs> To Atlantic That's City. Punish jail. So Ronda I'll remind Rousey. You. Go ahead. Ronda Rousey <laughs> released a new autobiography last week. And in the autobiography, she spoke, or no, it is available tomorrow. Sorry. 
she spoke about concussions and how for a long time she had concussions. But during her mixed martial arts career, she had them repeatedly. And ultimately, that is why she had to walk away. What do you make of Ronda being that open with the discussion about the concussions that she had, which ultimately led to her retirement? Very sensitive stuff. And when I read about that, I mean, for, first off, just from a, a personal standpoint, I, I really did feel for her. Then you start to kind of rework the career. And then I thought about her going in and taking those bumps in, in professional wrestling and, and being aware of this. And, uh, you know, I thought that she came out almost in a helpful manner to let other athletes know and, and, and maybe to say, hey, if I could have done it again, this is eventually the conclusion I came to, which is to protect myself and get myself out of there. Maybe I should have done it a little bit sooner. These were my interpretations. But partner she went back i mean my very first thought is thinking about her fight when did she take the first big one the first big one i saw the head kick in australia opposite holly home but Rhonda actually goes on to talk about the fact that this came back in her judo career that as she was getting thrown to the mat she yeah. was feeling these concussions but at that time 2006 2009 ish she wasn't really aware what they were. There was a movie that came out. Will Smith did a, a wonderful portrayal, but it had to do with the doctor that discovered uh, concussions. It was actually, the movie was called Concussion. And directly as it pertained <laughs> to his uh, dealings with Roger Goodell and the NFL. I only share that with you because that movie was right about this time that Ron is talking about. And that movie, while winning awards, was also very educational and eye-opening to us. And my interpretation from reading Ronda's stuff is that at the time, she wasn't fully aware of what was happening. She had these big dreams, some big goals. She found a way to push through. And I think that she's identifying it for, for other people and good on her if that was the case. Yeah, you know, Chill, it's such a uh, an odd thing to think back to the time when we competed and really never thinking about concussions. From football, when football, while I played it, was so uh, it was so physical. Let's say now, obviously, football today isn't as physical, so you don't get your bell rung as much. We were making, like, head-to-head -head competitions. You would talk about dropping your head when you would run the ball to get people off of you as a running back. Wrestling. I, had, I I one time was wrestling a guy, and I sprawled on him, and my chin hit the back of his shoulder. Chill. I see this video today, my brother, and I'm like, you could see me go a little bit limp, but when the kid reacts under me, this is college, the kid reacts under me, my instinct kick in, and I start wrestling him. I never remembered that. So it's like we, as those combat athletes as young, we constantly work on boom, boom, boom. And for Rhonda to have gone through all that, as most of us did younger, but go on to be what she was and not only fighting, but also wrestling and now being the person that goes out and speaks about it, that matters. That tells you that she wants to try and help the generation that follows. Because a lot of times you get embarrassed about that, man, because it's, it, it, can slow your speech, Muhammad Ali and those guys. It can really mess with your brain. Obviously, you and I don't have that problem. We're lucky. But there are a lot of fighters that struggle with this, our football players, our judo athletes. I'm just happy that she was able to have the career that she had because, Chael, so many of us have these issues and we never get to do much. We usually have to stop the sport that we're doing at the time. There was a great kid wrestler. Uh, as a freshman, he won the California State Tournament. But he had so many concussions that he never wrestled again, Chael. He would have been one of the greatest kids in California history and possibly in the NCAA. And he never wrestled again after his freshman year because he had so many concussions. Now we have the concussion headgear. It's kind of like a battering ram that goes over the front. It's They're doing so many things now to try to help kids. And I think Ronda's message will also help to further that. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I took it the same way. And people are always going to uh, question the integrity of the statement, particularly when somebody's trying to sell books. I, I, I only offer to them, because I've read some criticisms online where people aren't quite so sure and would like to hear this from a doctor. How does she get licensed? How do the commissions miss it? Hold on. I, I will tell you, not as a doctor, but as a wrestling coach that has to deal with several athletes, like the story that you told of that young wrestler, it's very tough. And a lot of times we just got to take a, a guy at his word. I had a young athlete under scholarship under Chris Pendleton at University of Oregon. And Daniel, he went in 
three times and said that he was having concussions. What my kid did not know is per the NCAA rule, if you make the statement three times, it doesn't have to have proof. If you yep. say it, we will believe you three times and you're out. And the reason that I speak about that is I don't know that Ronda's going to be able to return to the ring, which I'm not sure she's totally done with. I'm not sure she's ever going to uh, quite admit that she wants to never do MMA again. But having statements like this essentially shuts the book on those things, which I think adds to the sincerity. I think it speaks to another level of the courage. She knows the things that I just said. She knows those rules are in place, and she came out and did it anyway because I'm with you, partner. I think she did it to help others. Yeah, it's going to be an, it's gonna be an amazing book. Comes out tomorrow. You can get Ronda's book. She speaks about all things Ronda Rousey. If you're a fan, you don't want to miss it. And something else you don't want to miss is five rounds with DC and Chael. Chael, the fight bell rang. It's time to go to work. Demetrius Johnson is doing jujitsu against everyone. The other day, submit the 240-pound man, Chael. How impressive. I was impressed, but I wasn't surprised. Listen, I learned what jujitsu was by a man that weighed 176 pounds over the, the luxury of my television named Hoist Gracie back in 1993. And Hoist and his family maintained that the skills and technique of jujitsu, particularly within a gi, could overcome size. I think we got reminded of it here, but look, Demetrius has won everything that I've ever seen him compete in. This wasn't a surprise. You know, what was best for me was that Demetrius Johnson was going back and forth with a guy from the Nelk Boys named Bradley Martin who was talking about how he was way too big for Demetrius Johnson to handle him. And Demetrius Johnson kept telling this man, it doesn't matter how big you are, I have the skill level that will cause you a ton of problems. That right there was a reminder that if you mess with Demetrius Johnson, you might end up getting submitted, hey, in a mixed martial arts fight where the guy who is a skilled mixed martial artist, highest level, gets caught in something called a mousetrap where Demetrius throws him in the air, falls into an arm bar. This guy is next level. Y'all better not mess with the Mighty Mouse. I, I fully agree. You got to wrap it on the bell. We're moving to round two because Brandon Moreno, former world champion, perennial number one contender, and always main event style status, has announced he's going to take a little bit of time off, and I want to hear what you think of that. I love it, Chael. I love that Brandon Moreno decided to take some time because he's struggling, because sometimes we see former champions, when they hit a bit of an impasse, they don't know what to do, so they start switching weight classes. They seem to get a little desperate. Brandon Moreno recognizes, maybe I'm doing everything the right way, but my body just is not responding in the way that it expected to. So I am going to take some time away. I'm going to refocus, reset, and I'm going to come back the same Brandon Moreno that you guys remember. And Daniel, we just got done with the wrestling season. But when I do watch the wrestling season, or even when you and I went through it ourselves, the rankings when you start the season are very different than what you see halfway through the break at the turn of the new year, for example, or what you see at the end of the season, which was uh, in March or for us a week ago. And the reason I say that, it's not just the physical elements that will change through that grind. It's the mental side. And if a guy can take a break, take your oars out of the water every now and then, not only does your body recover, but your mind can get fresh and loosen up, and I think that's going to benefit Brandon Moreno. Very important for him to take that time away from the sport, but chill, we got to get to round three, my guy. Come on, that was five seconds past the round. Hey, Walt Harris doesn't have to really worry about round bells right now. This dude got suspended in-house by the UFC for years, chill. Are you surprised? No, I'm not. But I, I, I want to share a couple of things. I don't want to give a defensive wall. Look, having something rough happen to you in life and therefore that justifies, that's a criminal mindset. You don't want to have that and I don't want to do that as somebody that's defending him. I will just tell you, we know publicly everything that Walt has been through. To find out that he had made a couple of bad decisions, I think would make him human. I will also tell you this. Everyone's sick of somebody saying, I took something tainted and I didn't mean to. A lot of times you try to take something that you knew was banned. It was just tainted with something uh, even worse that you didn't know about. I think that might be what happened to Walt here. To find the substances that he, they found in his system and one of the reasons they really threw the book at him, you'd have to go to a museum. I don't believe that he did mean to take it, but he probably was trying to take something else. It's some of the old stuff that pops up whenever a guy is not trying to take something illegal. And that is where those guys find themselves in trouble. But like you said, man, feel a little bad for Walt Harris. But such is life, I guess, when it comes to drugging and drug testing.
Islam Mahachev clapped back at Dustin Poirier the other day. He told Dustin, well, if you'd beat anybody, you'd be the champion right now. Or if you could beat anybody, you'd be holding the belt instead of asking for a title fight. What did you make of Islam? Because, Chael, it seems like he's coming around to the dark side, which is what you and I both want to see. I like when he does it. I mean, look, I find him to be charming, and I find him secretly to be rather funny. I like when he goes after guys. And it is a really interesting juxtaposition. Islam is the champion, and he should be. He looks to me like he can outdo everybody in a mixed martial arts fight. But Poirier is a much bigger draw. He's a much bigger star, right? If they're both walking down the street, the line's going to be a lot bigger for Poirier. So sometimes the champion's really got to go after a guy. The champion in Islam is trying to get Poirier on the docket. Now, that's a hard night for anybody, but I'm just sharing for you, there's a reason he needs to go after him. And there's a reason that he, in this case, the champion really does need Poirier just as much as Poirier would like him. Yeah, absolutely. Islam needs that fight. But Islam is doing the right thing right now because he's allowing for Dustin Poirier to earn the spot and knowing that Dustin Poirier really is the only one that makes sense that's available on the timeline in which he wants to fight. So it makes sense. Make it a little bit contentious. Take shots at him. Make him know that he doesn't deserve an opportunity, but he's going to get one, but only get one because you're allowing him to. All right, they say you save the best for last. We got round five, and I find this to be a pretty interesting topic. It's a troll job done to Colby Covington, something Colby would never do to somebody else. What a terrible shot Ian Gary has taken him. Ian Gary is choosing to sell Make MMA Great Again hats. He's gone to social media. He's got a little online store, and he specifically is asking his fans to buy them to upset Colby Covington. <laughs> Look what I'm selling. Look what I just launched. You really want to piss off Kofi Covington? You make MMA great again and you retire his ass. Buy the cap and let's piss off Kobe. It's the subtleties, Chael. It's the little subtle things, right? You make it a blue hat. You make it a blue hat opposed to a red hat. You take shots at the things that you feel that Kobe Covington really cares about. You know he cares about the president. You know he cares about his stance politically. You try to make fun of the things that he cares about, especially if you want to fight him. He can do a lot to try to goad Kobe Covington. I think this is the best move that Ian Gary has done to this point. There was a guy when I was growing up named Brian Bosworth, and he was a very famous football player. He had kind of a unique hairdo when it was bleached blonde. He was doing a bunch of interviews. He played right up the road from me. He was with the Seattle Seahawks, but people had a definite passion towards him. I hate Boz t-shirts were everywhere. I love Boz t-shirts were everywhere. Later, we found out Bosworth himself made both of those t-shirts brought in seven million dollars it's actually what he used to retire and i'm only telling you that because if you can get people going both ways and i think that ian gary has done that he has absolutely done that what a massive move by ian gary at a time where he hasn't been making many great moves chill every week you and i talk and you ask me questions i ask you questions we have this great conversation but how about the fans would you be willing to answer questions from our fans if we took some from the YouTube comments? Anything, Jill. Anything. Anything. Anything our fans would like to know, they can come to yours truly. Uh, look, he said anything, guys. So look, go to the comment section. Drop those questions for me and Uncle Chael. We will answer them on the show when we get the best ones. Hey, and you don't have to be nice to Uncle Chael. He said he would answer anything. Drop those comments down in the... Sorry, go drop those questions down in the comments. Chael and I will answer them. Guys, that's another episode of Good Guy, Bad Guy. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's Chael Sonnen. Get us every Tuesday... Sorry. Get us every Monday and Thursday. Wherever you get your podcast. get us on YouTube, ESPN+, Plus, ESPN2, at midnight Eastern everywhere else you get your podcast. You get the good guy, you get the bad guy. For, I'm Ch for Chell Sonnen, I'm Daniel Cormier. Guys, we out.